The relative risk, odds ratio, and risk difference are the statistics we use for when we have two risk groups, risk and non-risk, and when we're interested in the question, is the risk associated with a focal outcome? The diagram shows what I mean. For example, we could think about groups that smoke and don't smoke, the two values for the risk factor, and their chances of getting lung cancer or not, the values for the outcomes. We would consider getting cancer to be the focal outcome, the one we care about, and ask whether that outcome is more or less likely depending on the risk factor, smoking or not smoking. The way we answer this question is that we compare the proportions observed to the proportions expected if the groups and outcomes are independent. To do this, we use the 2x2 contingency table shown. The first two in the 2x2 two two is the two treatments, and the second two is the two outcomes we're interested in. If the proportions are similar, the outcome is independent of the risk group. But if the proportions are different, the outcome is contingent on the risk group. Three statistics are commonly used to figure this out. The relative risk, also known as the risk ratio, excess risk, or attributable risk, the odds ratio, and the risk difference. Since we're using data from a sample, we need to calculate these statistics and their confidence intervals to estimate a range for the population relative risk, odds ratio, and risk difference values. We're usually interested in whether the relative risk or odds ratio are different from one, or the risk difference is different from zero. This channel has another video that talks more about exactly what these values represent, but in this video, we'll look at two numerical examples and do all the calculations. In our first example, let's look at the values shown here. There are twice as many total observations in the risk group, 2,000 versus 1,000, but three times as many that have the focal outcome, 15 versus 5. If the risk had no effect, we would expect 10 observations in the risk focal outcome combination because the risk group has exactly twice as many total observations as the non-risk group. Instead, we see 15, an extra 50%. From just looking at this, it appears that the effect of the risk is to increase the rate of the focal outcome by 50%. We're going to show some equations using the values in each of the four boxes in our contingency table. So to shorthand things, let's use the letters A, B, C, and D to represent the values in each of the boxes. First up, the relative risk, which is calculated using this equation. We can see that this calculates the probability of getting the focal outcome in the risk group, and then divides this by the probability of getting the focal outcome in the non-risk group. Values bigger than 1 indicate an increased probability of the focal outcome in the risk group relative to the non-risk group. Plugging in the values gives us 15 divided by 2,000 in the numerator, and 5 divided by 1,000 in the denominator for a relative risk value of 1.5. This makes sense. It accurately depicts the 50% increased risk we guessed before we even started. This is only the first step, however. We usually need to calculate confidence intervals if we're going to use this value. Unfortunately, calculating confidence intervals for the relative risk takes several steps, and we need to use natural logs and exponentiation to get them. First, we take the natural log of the relative risk, which is 0.405465. The next step is to use this equation to calculate the standard error of the natural log of the relative risk. Plugging in the values gives us the square root of 0.265166 repeating, which is 0.514943. Now that we have a value and a standard error, we do the usual thing of adding and subtracting a certain number of standard errors to the base value of 0.405465. We can use the normal distribution, so if we want a 95% confidence interval, we just add and subtract 1.96 standard errors to the base value. This gives us natural log of the relative risk, 0.405465, plus or minus 1.96 times the 0.514943 standard error value for an interval of negative 0.60382 to 1.41475. This confidence interval is for the natural log of the relative risk, however. To get this interval into a scale we can use, we need to exponentiate the lower and upper bounds. Doing this gives us e to the negative 0.60382, which is 0.54672, and e to the 1.414754, which is 4.11547. This gives us a 95% confidence interval for the relative risk of 0.5467 to 4.1155. The confidence interval includes the value 1.0, which means that while the relative risk in our sample is larger than 1, 1.5 to be precise, the population relative risk could easily be anything between 0.5467 and 4.1155. We therefore lack good evidence to conclude that the true relative risk is higher than 1 and that there is an elevated risk in the population. Next up is the odds ratio, which is calculated using this equation. 
This equation is less straightforward to understand than the relative risk. It calculates the ratios of the risk factor in the two outcome groups and then compares them. This is clearly related to an elevated risk, but the interpretation is not exactly the same. For example, while the ratio of the risks in the focal group is three, the ratio in the other outcome group is a bit different from exactly two, so we're not going to get a value of 1.5 for the odds ratio. Plugging in the values gives us 15 divided by five in the numerator and 1,985 divided by 995 in the denominator for an odds ratio value of 1.503778. This is very similar to the relative risk from before, but slightly larger. As before, we need to calculate confidence intervals if we're gonna use this value, and calculating confidence intervals for the odds ratio is also going to use natural logs and exponentiation. First, we take the natural log of the odds ratio, which gives us 0.407981. Then we use this equation to calculate the standard error of the natural log of the odds ratio. Plugging in the values gives us the square root of 0.268175, which is equal to 0.517857. Again, we're going to add and subtract 1.96 of these standard errors from our base odds ratio. This gives us natural log of the odds ratio, 0.407981, plus or minus 1.96 times 0.517857, to get an interval of negative 0.60702 to 1.42298 for the confidence interval of the natural log of the odds ratio. As before, to get this interval into a scale we can use, we need to exponentiate the lower and upper bounds to get e to the negative 60702, which is 0.54497, and e to the 1.42298, which is 4.14947. Our 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio of 0.5450 to 4.1495 includes the value of 1.0 which means that while the odds ratio in our sample is larger than one, the population odds ratio could easily be anything between 0.5450 and 4.1495, which includes a value of one, indicating no relationship between the risk and the outcome. We therefore lack good evidence to conclude that the true population odds ratio is larger than one, and that the risk to non-risk ratio is truly higher in the individuals possessing the focal outcome. Our third statistic is the risk difference, which is calculated using this equation. This equation simply calculates the proportion of observations in each risk category that have the focal outcome and takes the difference. Values larger than zero indicate relatively more focal outcomes in the risk group, and values less than zero indicate less. Plugging in the values and working through all the steps with our fractions gives us a value of 0.0025. Individuals in the risk group have a quarter of a percent higher chance, one in 400, of having the focal outcome compared to individuals in the non-risk group. As before, we need to calculate confidence intervals if we're gonna use this value, but this time we don't need natural logs and exponentiation, we can calculate the standard error directly. The equation to get the standard error is a bit complicated, but not too bad. Plugging in the values gives us the square root of 1.25 times 10 to the negative six, which is 0.002949. Again, we add and subtract 1.96 of these standard errors to our base value. This gives us 0.0025 plus or minus 1.96 times 0.002949 to get an interval of negative 0.00328 to positive 0.00828 for the confidence interval of the risk difference. Our 95% confidence interval for the risk difference includes zero, which means that while the risk difference in our sample is larger than zero, the population risk difference could easily be zero because that lies within our confidence interval. We therefore lack good evidence to conclude that the sample risk difference is significantly different from zero and that the true population risk difference differs from zero. Let's take another look at what our values and confidence intervals tell us. We have an overall question, does the risk increase the probability of experiencing the focal outcome? Our sample data gives us these relative risk, odds ratio, and risk difference values, which makes it look like the risk does increase the probability of the focal outcome. Our sample data also gives us these confidence intervals. The 95% confidence interval for the relative risk includes one, indicating a non-significantly larger relative risk in our sample. The 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio includes one indicating a non-significantly larger odds ratio in our sample. The 95% confidence interval for the risk difference includes zero, indicating a non-significantly larger risk difference in our sample. Taking these values together, the answer to our question is that the data suggests that the risk factor might increase the chances of the focal outcome, but we lack significance, so can't conclude this.
The data values we got are within the range that random chance and sampling error could generate, so we wouldn't use them to make conclusions about how the risk factor raises the probability of the focal outcome in a wider system than just our sample. Now let's look at another example. In this second example, let's look at these values. I've kept the total number of values in each risk group the same, 2,000 versus 1,000, but I've increased the number of observations in the focal outcome column. As before, the effect of the risk is to increase the rate of the focal outcome by 50% since we see there are three times as many values there. The relative risk is the probability of getting the focal outcome in the risk group divided by this probability in the non-risk group. Plugging in the values and going through the steps gives us 49.5, divided by 33 for a relative risk value of 1.5, which accurately depicts the 50% increased risk we predicted. As before, we need to calculate confidence intervals to use this value, and that means natural logs and exponentiation. The natural log of the relative risk is 0.405465. Now we use the equation for the standard error of the natural log of the relative risk. Plugging in the values gives us the square root of 0.03890, which is 0.197241. Now we add and subtract our standard error to the natural log of the relative risk value to get the first confidence interval. In this video, I'm using 1.96 to get 95% confidence intervals, but you could use other values like 2.575 standard errors to get a 99% confidence interval if you wanted. Since we want a 95% confidence interval, we use the 1.96 value to get the natural log of the relative risk, 0.405465, plus or minus 1.96 times the 0.197241 to get an interval from 0.01887 to 0.79206. This confidence interval is for the natural log of the relative risk, so we exponentiate the lower and upper bounds to get e to the 0.01887, which is 1.01905, and e to the 0.79206, which is 2.20793. This gives us a 95% confidence interval for the relative risk of 1.1091 to 2.2079. This confidence interval doesn't include the value 1.0, which indicates that the sample relative risk is significantly larger than 1. Our best estimate for the population value is 1.5, but there's a 95% chance that it's anything from as small as 1.02 to something as big as 2.2. It looks like the risk factor probably does increase the chances of seeing the focal outcome in the population. Now for the odds ratio, which we're expecting to be significantly larger than 1 if it's consistent with the elevated relative risk. Using the odds ratio equation and plugging in the values gives us 99 divided by 33 in the numerator and 1901 divided by 967 in the denominator, which is 3 divided by 1.965874 for an odds ratio value of 1.526039. This is still fairly similar to the relative risk, but larger than 1.5 by a greater magnitude than in our previous example. Now for the confidence interval. First, we take the natural log of the odds ratio, which is 0.422675. Using this equation, for the standard error of the natural log of the odds ratio, gives us the square root of 0.041964, which is 0.204852. As before, we're going to add and subtract 1.96 of the standard errors to get a 95% confidence interval. This gives us natural log of the odds ratio, 0.422675 plus or minus 1.96 times 0.204852 to get an interval of 0.021166 to 0.824185 for the confidence interval of the natural log of the odds ratio. We exponentiate these lower and upper bounds, e to the 0.021166, which is 1.02139, and e to the 0.824185, which is 2.28002 to get our confidence interval. Our odds ratio 95% confidence interval of 1.0214 to 2.2800 does not include the value 1.0, which means that the sample odds ratio is significantly larger than 1. Our best estimate for the population odds ratio is 1.526, but it could easily be anything between 0.02 and 2.28. It looks like the risky trait is more common in those with the focal outcome than in those without it. Now for the risk difference, which we're expecting to be larger than zero. As before, the equation simply calculates the difference between the proportions of observations that show the focal outcome in each risk category. Plugging in the values and evaluating them gives us a value of 0.01650.
Individuals in the risk group seem to have a 1.65% higher chance of having the focal outcome than individuals in the non-risk group. Next step, the standard error and confidence intervals. Here's the equation to get the standard error again, and plugging in all the values gives us a final value of 0.00074455. Adding and subtracting 1.96 standard errors gives us an interval of 0.00191 to 0.03191 for the confidence interval of the risk difference. No surprise, our 95% confidence interval for the risk difference doesn't include zero, which means that the sample risk difference is significantly larger than zero. Our best estimate for the increase in the population is 1.65%, but it could be just barely larger than zero or as large as almost 3.2%. It really does look like the focal outcome is more common in the group with the risk factor than in the group without it. As we did for the first example, let's take a look at what our full set of values and confidence intervals tell us. Again, our overall question is, does the risk increase the probability of experiencing the focal outcome? Our sample data gives us relative risk and odds ratio values larger than one and a risk difference larger than zero. So these results suggest that the risk might increase the probability of the focal outcome in the population. Our sample data then gave us these confidence intervals. The 95% confidence interval for the relative risk does not include one, indicating a relative risk significantly larger than one. The 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio does not include one, indicating an odds ratio significantly larger than one. The 95% confidence interval for the risk difference does not include zero, indicating a significantly elevated risk difference. Taking these values together, the significant results indicate that the risk factor increases the chances of the focal outcome in the population, but we should be cautious. While our confidence intervals do indicate that there's a 95% chance that the risk factor is associated with an increased probability of the focal outcome, this isn't 100%. The confidence intervals don't include one or zero, but they are quite close, so we would want to be cautious with how convincing we think this evidence is. There's a small chance, less than 5%, but not zero, that the risk factor does not increase the probability of the focal outcome in the population, and we might be making a type 1 error when we conclude that the risk factor increases the chances of the focal outcome. If you're not familiar with this type of error, you can watch a video we have on this channel all about this. We can also see a couple of interesting things when comparing the results from the two examples. While the relative risk is the same for both sets of data, the odds ratio is not. It's higher in the second example because the odds ratio is always larger than the relative risk. If the overall probability of the focal outcome is extremely low, then they're almost the same and it's not a problem. But if the focal outcome isn't super rare, then the odds ratio can be much higher than the relative risk. In the first example, the overall probability of the focal outcome is less than 1%, whereas in the second example, it's 4.4%. The fact that these values can differ quite a bit is a major reason why we need to be careful to not confuse the different interpretations of the relative risk and the odds ratio. The second thing to note is that we can see the effects of the sample size in the four boxes of our contingency table. In the second example, we have the same relative risk and total sample size, albeit larger odds ratios and risk differences. But the confidence intervals indicate a significance mainly because the smallest values in our tables are larger. Having more observations of the things we're interested in gives us more power to detect increased proportions in various categories. Incidentally, this is why it's hard to determine genuine risk factors for rare outcomes. It's very difficult to design a study with enough of the focal outcome. There's a high resolution PDF of this full image on the Stats Examples website. Like or subscribe if you found this video useful and feel free to share this with anyone you know who will find it useful.